Also, folks, um, I will be sending out an announcement to you all and to the folks in second year. Um, I was hoping we'd have a room, um, but it seems that it's, there's some issues with timetabling and it's just getting the room. So next Wednesday, and I don't remember the exact time, I think it's 11 a.m., we're going to have a briefing on one of the options you have for the flight test course requirement that you have to undertake as part of your undergraduate degree. Now, there is the standard UOM included in your fees option um, that you'll find out more about next year. But this is for those of you who are interested in it. It is something that you would have to pay for, and it's not an insubstantial cost. But it's something we've been doing for a number of years until last year. And you can imagine why when I tell you about it, we didn't do it last year. You have the opportunity to spend two weeks in the summer in northern Michigan, in Traverse City, doing both manned flight and UAV testing and operations. So you spend one week flying manned aircraft. You get about six hours of actual flight time which three of those you will be behind the yoke. So sitting next to the flight instructor and three of those in the back seat. Now you have the opportunity when doing those to either fly the maneuvers yourself or instruct the competent pilot to fly the maneuvers. Um, and then the person in the back is taking notes and giving information and the like. And then you download the data and you process it. So that's six hours, just two of you plus a flight instructor. Um, there's some other stuff in that week. Um, and just due to weather, there's some buffer. The second week, you spend at their dedicated UAV airfield. And in the past, um, we've done just UAV flights. So you'll build a UAV, operate it, do all the flight planning, flight testing, dealing with the uh, uh, autopilot and the software. Um, also, weather and otherwise permitting, do rocket launches and do telemetry off the rockets. So it is a full width, two week opportunity, which is obviously much broader. Um, the fees include or have included in the past the course and the lodging. It's a, there's additional costs to get there. Obviously, you have to feed yourself unless you want to starve yourself for two weeks, which I don't advise. Um, and the like. So it isn't insubstantial. But the briefing is next Wednesday, I believe at 11. Um, it's going to be myself and then our uh, hosts on the other side that run this with us um, remotely. They're not coming here this year uh, for this. Um, and then there are other opportunities beyond that. So you can stay a little longer um, or do some additional flights. My personal favorite thing to do when I've accompanied the students there is I go up and do aerobatic flights because flying upside down is much more fun than flying right side up. Um, eventually, um, and the like. But you can also then, there are seaplane flights, you can do additional flights. Those, if you do additional hours, um, there's an additional expense because you have to be cleared by the TSA because they're paranoid. Um, well, there's reasons um, and additional costs. But um, all next week, you don't have to do it. Um, it is live in a room. Um, we don't expect you all to do it. We get, generally get about six people a year um, that are interested in doing it uh, and the like. Okay. Um, everybody still filling out the survey? So I will send an announcement out. I was hoping to have a room number for you. I think I'll send the announcement out later today regardless with the flyer and information um, and then update you on the room number. It should show on your timetable when all is said and done and it should be labeled optional so you don't have to attend. Don't feel you're obligated to attend. But if you are interested, do attend. We will record it, hopefully. Um, so that it is available for you if you miss it, if you can't attend. Um, I know for the second years, there's some students on the management track that can't attend. So we are going to record it regardless. And keep in mind, you have it, if you can't do it this year, you could do it next summer. We have ultimate opportunities. And then, of course, there's ours, um, which uh, you know, you'll be able to do too.
Okay, we'll get started. You're welcome to continue filling this out if you want. Um, oh. The first question on an aerospace craft, is the fuel system always considered part of the propulsion system? And uh, to date, we have 45 votes. So um, I'm about to reveal the results. Those of you who see there can still answer. Right now, 64% of you said yes, and 36% said no. So this is a, one. A, not all aerospace vehicles have fuel systems. Can anybody think of an aerospace vehicle that wouldn't have a fuel system? Yeah. A glider. Yep, gliders. If you don't have a propulsion system, you generally don't need one. Um, something simpler. Something that we all have probably bought at one time at a party store or something gotten for a birthday. Yeah, so like a helium or hydrogen balloon. Not a hot air balloon because you need something to create the heat, but they wouldn't have it. But can we think of a system where it would have a fuel system and we would label it not as part of the propulsion system? Because that's the real question. Are there aerospace craft where there are fuel systems we don't label as directly part of the propulsion system? Yeah, potentially. Um, so like electric UAVs, we do tend to label the batteries as part, but large commercial aircraft, we label them separate. Yeah, they're linked together, but they're separate. Um, how about on a rocket? Are there some rockets where we label them as part of it and some where we don't? Yeah. Yeah, that's could be, yeah. We don't propel, we just have guidance. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, but also, think about a chemical rocket. Liquid rockets, we often label the fuel system as separate. We have maybe some compression tanks and all of that stuff. But on a solid rocket, it's just one and the same. The combustion chamber is where the fuel lies. So yes, it can be considered. But no, it is not always considered. So now, that's fine. The fact that, you know, it's just that understanding. So, aha, when you're taking a test, think about these things. What's the test really asking? What's the question asking? If it asks for always, can you think of one case where it wouldn't be? If it asks for never, can you think of one case where it would? And that helps you answer the questions. This is also a bit of a prep if you haven't yet done the glider activity, but more so for things like the midterm and the final exam. Um, I'm, you know, I, I do these things on purpose. OK, where are the flaps on this one? Could you see that picture on your Slido? OK. 80% um, of you put the trailing edge, 13% put the leading edge, and 4% um, put the root cord, and 2% put the tip cord. OK, so this is one we can show a little bit more detail. Doo -doo -doo. And we'll go to our real aircraft. So that's our real aircraft. Anybody know what aircraft this is? This is not something I expect you to know for a test, by the way. Yes? Uh, yeah, it is the 787-8. Um, so we have our wing here. This is our leading edge. This is our trailing edge. Same thing with our stabilizers. You have a leading and trailing edge. Leading just means airflow hits it first. Trailing means the airflow hits it last on that surface. Now, we clearly have some sort of flaps on the trailing edge, right? And those two types of flaps are, are flaps that we use for lift augmentation and the flaps we use for control. Anybody remember what the flaps we use for control are called on our wing, typically? Yep. Ailerons. Yeah, they're ailerons. We use them for roll control. Um, and the 787, it's a bit of a mix. So you have distinct flaps inboard and outboard. And you have an inboard aileron and an outboard aileron. And this is a Boeing design philosophy. On an Airbus aircraft, we now typically have split ailerons out here they call inboard and outboard. And the reason they're different is they're different structural design philosophies on the wing. Boeing wings tend to be very flexible. 
Um, to the point that at high speed, historically, we have gotten what's called aileron reversal. That means the pilot decides, I want to roll right. So he puts in the roll right command. And what does the aircraft do? It rolls left, which is not ideal. So we will talk about an aircraft in the future. Um, it was Boeing's first thin-winged jet aircraft. Um, anybody know what aircraft that was? It was not a commercial transport. It had a more nefarious use. So it was the B-47. And it had only outboard ailerons, because the Boeing aircraft before that did. And at flight, you know, at speed, they would, would roll wrong. So instead, what Boeing and the pilots decided to do is they wouldn't use the ailerons at high speed. They would use the rudder instead. So there was a nice placard that said, be careful about using the rudder for roll control. If you do it too much, the tail will break off. And it did occasionally break off. Um, uh, and there's then B-52, which they got rid of the ailerons on the B-52 because they were so problematic and used spoilers for roll control. Um, it also had a problem where the tail would occasionally break off, and they actually landed a couple safely after tail separation. Um, it's generally not good to have your vertical stabilizer separate. Okay, this inboard aileron is what's called a flapperon. It does dual rolls. And you'll hear this all the time where we mix control surfaces to have two rolls. So a flapperon does both roll control, and in the case of the 787, at higher speeds, they use that one, they lock out the outboard aileron, and high lift. And if you actually look at it, it's a slotted flap. And we'll talk more about those when we get to wings and lifting things later in the semester. But it separates, there's a gap and all this stuff, and you'll see it move up and down. Okay, now, on the leading edge, there are these devices. They are called slats. Now, slats are a combination of slot and flap. So yes, if you said leading edge, you are technically correct. I'm not sure I actually put it as correct. I'm sorry if I didn't uh, on this. Or I didn't even say, maybe. So leading edge and trailing edge are technically correct. So the root cord and the tip cord are these here. So this is the root cord, and that's the tip cord, and they obviously on this do not have flaps. Okay? So, what aerospace craft do not typically have a propulsion system? We have balloons, we have dirigibles, we have spacecraft, rotary craft, rotary wing aircraft, launch vehicles, and fixed wing aircraft. Um, so typically, obviously there are some fixed wing aircraft without a propulsion system. What do we call those again? Gliders, yep. Um, launch vehicles, by definition, tend to have a propulsion system. Can anybody think of a launch vehicle that wouldn't have a propulsion system? where the vehicle itself has no propulsion system. Yeah. No, so we're using them to get satellites into orbit. No, good answer. So we generally call um, satellites spacecraft on their own. It's kind of the absurd one, yep. Okay, so if we used a balloon as a launch vehicle, by the way, this is actually a concept. It's called a raccoon. They use the balloon to carry it up to altitude and then use a rocket. So that combination would have one, but the balloon par portion wouldn't necessarily. So actually, a very valid answer. Um, this one's a bit more absurd. Um, there was actually the concept of using guns to fire things into orbit, and those wouldn't, the vehicle itself wouldn't have it, but the gun obviously would. So balloons don't typically have propulsion systems. Even a hot air balloon, that fuel and combustion system is for buoyancy. It's not for propelling it around. Um, dirigibles generally do because we're trying to get somewhere. Spacecraft may or may not. So a lot of CubeSats don't have propulsion systems at all. 
They have no thrusters even for um, control and orientation. Obviously, launch vehicles do. Rotary wing vehicles typically do. Um, you would have to be pure, purely auto rotation not to, and then fixed wing aircraft may or may not. So in this case, typically not is a balloon. Okay, everything else we typically do see it, but not every version will have it. Okay, next one. What transmits the control inputs from the fixed frame to the rotating frame on a rotor craft? And the answers you had to choose from were the control rods, the swash plates, the hinges, the gearbox, and the hub. Now, this is important because these are the kind of little details that ultimately you're going to be expected to know if you do something like helicopters. So we'll go to our rotary wing aircraft here. And we'll look at our rotor hub, our stylized version of a rotor hub. So the control rods come up from the pilot, and then also there are control rods that go up. This is your swash plate in the middle. Now, these control rods are fixed, and these control rods are rotating. So they're in two different frames. It is the swash plate here that converts between the two. Basically, it's just got a bunch of bearings. The bottom of the swash plate is fixed. The top of the swash plate is rotating. And it transmits those from one frame to the other by basically moving up and down and tilting. Up and down is what's called collective because everything moves together. The blades all move as one. When it tilts, it's called cyclic because the blades will cycle. They will change as they go around in the cycle. Up here at the top, you have your rotor hub. There are hinges. They're either actual mechanical or they may just be structural hinges, bending, actually materials that bend elastometric. And then we have our blades. So down, down below, that's the gearbox. If any of these things fail, like catastrophically, it's bad news. And generally, the thing that fails is the gearbox, the main bearing in the gearbox, and then the rudder comes off. And that's all she wrote. Um, so you don't want much damage here, but that swash plate is the bit that controls, takes the control inputs from the fixed frame to the rotating frame. Okay. So that's the end of the first poll. We'll close that one and go back. So we have some questions. How come some of the questions on the mock glider quiz are not related to the glider activity? So the mock quiz, the practice quiz, is actually a mixture of all the quiz types. So some of the questions are glider, some of the questions are systems activity, and some of the questions are midterm style questions. So the beauty is it gives you practice answering those question types and also allows you to look at what types of questions you might get in those quizzes. So you did it, you took it, you took the practice for the glider. You obviously got some of the midterm ones right and some of them wrong because maybe you've not read ahead. Maybe you've not even gotten up to where we are on to speed yet. And you might have gotten the systems activity quizzes right or wrong. It doesn't matter when you get ready to do the midterm. You can go back to it and practice some more. And when you get ready to do the systems activity quiz, you can practice some more. So that's what that does. It serves four purposes, get you ready for each individual quiz, and also get you ready for the style of a test that we use. Okay? Clear that one. Is the glider quiz focused on the glider practical PDF on Blackboard? So the glider quiz is about your glider and the way it flies. So those, that PDF from the activity, filling in and answering those questions, having that in front of you will help you answer them. Now, I have received an email or two, maybe more because I haven't checked my emails this morning, about this next type of question. How do we access the mock and the glider quiz? Some of you will be able to access the, the glider quiz from the learning module for the practical activity. 
Some of you will not. I have no idea why it works for some and not for others. So what you do is go to assessment and feedback on the left-hand side and access both from there, because that's where they actually reside, because that's the standard we're supposed to use. The, putting it in the learning module is just the way learning modules are designed to do, and you can access it there. Okay. Ah, just a random question, not related to the topic, but what's the difference between VNAV and LNAV in an autopilot system? It's an interesting one. Perfectly germane. Um, so autopilots, which are part of the flight control system, um, autopilots basically fly the aircraft for you so you don't make stupid mistakes and you can take a nap which you're not supposed to do, but um, we all know that pilots fall asleep when flying aircraft. Uh, there's a NASA study survey where they looked at and asked pilots to report things anonymously. And some large percentage of transatlantic and transpacific flights, the, one of the flying flight crew members would wake up to find the other one also asleep. Um, which, you know, you think is bad, but in crews, not much happens, and there's lots of alarms when things do happen, and most people don't sleep through alarms. I have slept through a few fire alarms. Um, and I'd rather them to be somewhat rested than completely uh, unrested and hypoxic when they have to deal with it. So um, there are multiple modes on autopilot systems, but two of the common ones we see are VNAV and LNAV. VNAV, the V stands for vertical, and it is just that. It controls the aircraft in the vertical plane. So it may hold an altitude or fly a specific rate of climb. So x feet per minute up or negative, down, um, and the like. And there are more sophisticated things with flight management computers where you can program it to go to a waypoint, to climb, and then fly level for a while, and all of that stuff. Now, what's interesting? How many of you have gone on a website like Flight Radar 24 or the equivalent? Okay, so those websites use something called ADSB, which stands for Automatic Depend Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. There's also ADSC. There's other things like that, which C is contract. Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast is a system where the aircraft shouts out to the rest of the world, "Here I am, and here's what I'm doing." Now, there are a couple different modes of this, and it links in what's called mode S on your transponder, um, so it can be queried. Now, the basic thing, it tells you what altitude you're at, both GPS, if you have it, and barometric. It gives you the barometric barometer setting that the aircraft's using, it tells you what the ground speed and the airspeed or Mach number are. But other things can be queried, and air traffic control systems can send out a pulse with their radar and say, what else about the aircraft? Can you give me your next waypoint in addition to your heading? Can you give me the next vertical speed that you're commanding? All of this stuff. And it's, that's what the Mode S transponder is about. Now, a number of years ago, and I always forget what year it was, there was a crash where the co-pilot of a German wings flight locked the captain out of the cockpit because that's what they can do, because we don't want people to get in unless the people in the cockpit flight deck want them in. Um, and then decided he was going to kill himself and everybody on board. We don't know why he decided this, but what he did is he just dialed in minus 3,200 feet per minute onto the vertical nav, and the aircraft just descended into the mountains, crashed, killed everyone on board. And the way they figured this out, that was what happened, is via ADSB and the VNAV query that the French ATC was using. And you could see that it was commanded through the autopilot to do that. Okay, LNAV is just lateral. So it's what direction you're flying, fly a heading, fly to this waypoint. And that's the difference between those two. And you can have them both on, connected to the flight management computer, and do much more sophisticated flying, fly waypoints, fly through um, uh, fixes, fly just through points in space and all of that. We are now getting what's called 4D nav, 
which says, I want to be at this point in space, altitude, latitude, longitude, at this time. And the aircraft will actually fly the right air, the ground speed to do that by adjusting the airspeed as it detects winds. Um, it's a little less accurate, but we are using that transatlantic. You are to be at this point over the ocean at this time. Okay. Does a COPV system on a rocket work as part of the propulsion system? Uh, COPV. Initialism, folks. What's the brain fart this morning? I should know it. I probably told it to you. Anybody want to re-ask this question? Spelling out COPV or just shout it out. Okay, uh, I'm gonna leave that one up and we'll go to the next survey. Survey two. Okay. Um, those of you who have, are doing your polls and want to do it, continue. Um, that's not what I want. So what is the third brightest object in the sky? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what's the first brightest, the, most, the brightest of all? The sun, soul. Uh, and number two, when it's visible at least? The moon, yeah. Okay, so natural objects. Obviously, Venus is next. Um, and then I think it's actually Jupiter and then Mars, believe it or not. I could be wrong. Um, that's, that brings up the weird one. Um, anybody know, on average, what the closest planet to Earth is? On average. Anybody know? This is one of those weird things. Now, you have to keep in mind there's this eccentricities in orbit. Um, the closest object to Earth, outside of the moon, natural object, um, on average is the sun. Yeah. But the closest planet is Mercury. Now, Mercury is never, never the closest planet in like the minimum sense, but on average. then. Um, then Venus, then Mars. Um, Venus is the one that approaches Earth the closest of all the planets, but it also spends time far away on the opposite side of the sun and that, those radii. Um, okay. Um, so as we get into this, it turns out the third brightest object, if you see it, is a man-made object, single object. Um, and it is, of course, the largest of the man-made objects there. Um, <laughs> some of you change your answer. Uh, so yes, it is the ISS. And the reason it's so bright is it's got lots of solar panels, but it also has lots of radiators. Because one of the problems in space, especially if you've got the human beings on board, is we don't like extremes. We can tolerate, if we're not wet, down to about minus 10. You can go sit out and be dry and out of the wind in minus 10 degrees, completely unclothed, and provided you have enough food, you will not die of hypothermia. The moment you get wet, you're dead. In fact, if you are outside and can't get dry, even at 15 degrees, you will die of hypothermia. Human beings are not very resilient. You don't work much above 40, you can do some things to get up to about 50, but anything above that, we tend not to work very well. We die. Something about proteins denaturing and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so we put human beings on board, and all the stuff that keeps us alive, it generates heat. There's only one way to get rid of heat in space, and that's to radiate it. So they have massive panels on the ISS, much bigger surface area than solar panels, because it turns out they're even less efficient to reject heat into the atmosphere. And because of that, they don't want to retain heat. They have to reflect any sunlight that hits them. So they're this weird thing that is, doesn't absorb anything and emits, so they reflect. And so therefore, we can see the ISS in the sunlight. Um, and it, on a, those occasional clear nights in the UK, 
When the timing's right, you can see it go overhead because the ISS orbit's great for that. It's a crappy, crappy orbit. It's this horrible compromise that's limited by the performance of Soyuz and shuttle. It sits way too low, so it's got way too much drag, so they're constantly having to boost it. It also tends to like run into things, or not run into, but has that risk of running into things like upper stages of rockets because it's in a bad orbit for that. You know, it, there's all sorts of things about it. Um, and then the third brightest, uh, the second brightest man-made op single object would be Hubble. Um, now Starlink, in its conglomeration with all of its reflectors, is screwing up all the astronomy. So if you know a, any optical astronomer, um, they really do not like Elon Musk because, and they do not like the U.S. government because the U.S. government actively subsidized Starlink to destroy optical telescopes. It was one of, they said, we don't care. It doesn't matter. Science doesn't matter. So they're not very happy about that. Um, and the like. So that's our third brightest object, and it's man-made, and why? Okay. The Hubble Space Telescope is a modified version of what? Now, it's not a submarine. I'm glad no one put that. Um, it's not a deep space probe. They don't look like that. It is, as most of you have put, a spy satellite. And it's a modified version of what we believe is what we would call, what you and I call the KH-11. By the way, that is not what the National Reconnaissance Office in the US calls it. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a KH-11. It never existed. Huh? Just like the US has never actively produced and purified tritium. Yeah, never done that. Never mind that they use it, so they somehow have to got, have had it, acquired it. But yeah, um, it is a modified version of that, and to the point that to work on the Hubble Space Telescope, to do maintenance on it, an astronaut has to have a top secret clearance. Oops, sorry. With specialized compartmentalized information for that area, the mirrors are still classified. So you and I cannot look up the specs of the mirrors because they are top secret. Um, now, the other funny thing about the Hubble Space Telescope is that uh, we all know it's got a bad mirror, right? That they had to do a servicing mission not long after it went up because it couldn't actually resolve anything because the mirror is out by, I think it's a couple microns out of the curvature it needs to be. Um, there is a perfectly good Hubble Space Telescope mirror sitting in a warehouse to today on the ground. Because, of course, like many NASA things, they expect at least one of them to fail. Um, so they made two mirrors. And the company that made, by two different companies, just in case, classic NRO. Um, and the good one is sitting on the ground because the bad one, the company knew it was bad, but didn't want to admit it because they didn't want to take a financial penalty, so it's up there. Um, this two of things really shows us in the NRO, De Defense Department National Reconnaissance Office, their behavior, why space launches were really expensive. Every rocket until recently that the US launched a military or reconnaissance payload on, there was another rocket that could be deployed within two weeks. Had to be ready in the shed because if that failed, they had to get it up there. And actually, they've done it before. If you look at the history of NRO launches, there's a failure every once in a while, and literally within two weeks, there's another NRO launch. Um, and SpaceX finally convinced them that at some point, they would have the cadence where that wouldn't matter. You didn't have to have a spare rocket sitting around. The government said, okay, and they couldn't make it then. It took them another couple of years, but they've finally done it. So they've changed the thing. But that's why space launches are so expensive. You had to buy two rockets for every rocket. And you weren't allowed to say, oh, by the way, the one you didn't use last time we'll reuse again. No, 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 that's not how it worked. Even though the company sold you that rocket, you had to buy it again. See? So, um, and then shuttle was the same way. Shuttle was supposed to be able to be launched another shuttle a couple weeks later. Never really worked that way, except for after Ch uh, Columbia, they actually started doing that. And depending what orbit and what mission, if they could go to the International Space Station, you had a month. But when they went to service Hubble, you had seven days. 
So all of a sudden, the launch costs went from 750 million a launch for shuttle to about two and a half billion from other things. You know, most expensive launch vehicle ever devised. Makes everything else look cheap and easy. Okay. Next one. What, aeros what systems are common to almost all aerospace craft? So 73% of you put control. Do weather balloons have control systems? Nah, they don't. Some do, actually. They have systems that vent gas. It's a passive control to keep it at an altitude for a long time, but a lot of them just go up and pop. That's all they do. So control, some do, some don't. Structure, yeah, everything has a structure. You have to, even if you just have an envelope on a balloon, it's part of the pay, of structural system. The structure is, yep. And then, of course, um, payload. Because even, even if you're just going up for the sake of flying for fun, you are the payload. Um, other ones are optional. We don't need communications. People, there are people that fly aircraft today without radios. Out in the west of the U.S., it's great. There's no one around. You're, the thing you're going to hit is a mountain. It's your own damn fault. Um, they don't have guidance and navigation systems necessarily. I mean, your glider that you threw didn't have one. Questionable whether a pilot is. I mean, that's their job. Some have propulsion, some don't. But structures and payload are pretty much common everywhere. Now, that's not to say that we don't have control on most of our systems. That's not to say most of our systems don't have propulsion or guidance and navigation. But they're not essential across all of aerospace. So you're going to spend a lot of time on it because it's really useful. But that doesn't mean it's essential in all cases. Again, it's one of those weird things. What's truly essential? Well, we need structure. We need something to get us up there. So if it's an atmospheric vehicle, we need something to generate lift. But that could be a wing, it could be buoyant gas, it could be, but we don't need other systems. They come in handy and they're really useful and they make our lives better, but we don't necessarily need them. Okay, the last one that we'll finish out here before we start, uh, just quickly, um, after we do our questions, uh, if we have time, will be just our, our, our word association again. Uh, oh, that's interesting, live. I want. Uh, what do you think happened to Malaysia Flight 370, and why can't we locate it? Okay, the reason we can't locate it is we don't actually have instantaneous, continuous coverage worldwide of the airspace. In fact, we're just now beginning to get there with satellite ADSB. Before that, and for most of history, once an aircraft went more than 50 or 60 miles offshore, we didn't know where it was unless it said, hello, use what's called high frequency radio and said, hello, I believe I'm at this location, right? And I, I say believe because at first they used sextants and they shot the stars or looked at the sun and the aircraft's bouncing around. That's kind of hard to do. And that only told you latitude. You know how we told, figured out where we were longitudinally? We use clocks, same in ships. In a ship, you went slow enough you could look at, wait for noon each day, figure out how far off it was from the noon where you left. You figured out how far east or west you were from where you were. But on aircraft, we literally used clocks. We just said, we think we flew at this heading in this wind for this amount of time. It's called dead reckoning. And of all the forms of navigation, it's probably our least accurate because even though we do use inertial systems, they're much more accurate. When the human being's involved, you go way off course really fast. And there's an old joke, if you rely on dead reckoning, at some point you will end up that first word because it's not very accurate. So we just don't know where aircraft are. Now we're beginning to get, we, we get pings every once in a while from a satellite. But that's expensive, so maybe it was every half an hour and the like, and you could turn it off and all of that. So we don't know exactly where it went. Due to other pings, just ping, I'm alive, ping, I'm alive, because they didn't pull the circuit breakers, we at least knew it was flying around for a while. In hindsight, 
we had to look in the noise. And due to um, some things about time, time of flight on that satellite signal and the like, we could track it down to a relatively narrow part of the Earth. Now, relatively narrow, when you're talking about the Southern Ocean, is still a big lot of empty. And that's why we haven't found it. Now, we might get closer, we might not. But remember, the Titanic sank in the busiest shipping lanes in the world at the time in the North Atlantic. And it still took us 75 years to find it. And we knew where it was, where it was, when it sank. So it takes a while to find these things. We got lucky flying, finding Air France Flight 442 because we were searching in the wrong place. And then someone said, well, wait about here. And we just happened to find it. If we hadn't done that, we would still be looking for the wreckage for that today. Are the Bermuda Triangle myths real? Uh, like all myths, they are usually grounded in something factual. Now, the Bermuda Triangle, also known as the Sargasso Sea, is this weird nominal triangle between Florida, or the Bahamas, North Carolina, and Bermuda. It is a graveyard of aircraft and ships. But it's a graveyard of aircraft and ships because if you're flying from, say, Florida to New York, you don't fly over land. If you look at the east coast of the US, it bows in and then comes back out again. You have to fly through the Bermuda Triangle. Now, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, we weren't very good at finding hurricanes. So you might fly into a hurricane or other storm. Now, nowadays we can avoid them, fly over them, whatever it is. But if you're a small aircraft flying into the wall of a hurricane and you're not prepared, that's not a good place to be. Also, just remember that uh, aircraft engines were not particularly reliable back then. The old joke about the Lockheed Constellation and the Douglas DC-7, which were four-engine aircraft, they were the best three-engine aircraft across the Atlantic. Because invariably, in any flight, you'd lose an engine. Yeah, it was that reliable. So if you're in a single-engine, high-performance, piston fighter attack aircraft, it just conks out, you're out to sea, you're going to glide into the ocean. So in that sense, there is a history, but it isn't anything nefarious or different. It's just those combination of things, and that's why we get the myth. Is it true there is a no radio contact zone in the Atlantic Ocean during uh, inter intercontinental, or, uh, transcontinental, no, intercontinental flights? Um, yes, no, kind of. Um, you always, everywhere in the world, um, you are connected on typical air routes via now SATCOM links, and before that, high-frequency radio. Now, high-frequency radio is really interesting. It's not a very high bandwidth, so it sounds really, really dull. Everything sounds flat, and you can't have a whole lot of people talking. Um, but no, there was not a point where there was no radio contact, but we had no radar contact, no point. The aircraft had to tell us where they were. And they would ping, you reach this location, call us. And there's things like selective calling and all of that. But now, we actually have satellite ADSB. We know where those aircraft are across the North Atlantic. Um, we'll talk, we can talk a little bit more about North Atlantic tracks and the history of that, but it is kind of fascinating. How come we used to observe Starlink satellites with our VR or bare eyes so easily during the early launches and it's not so easy now? Um, it just depends on the launch trajectory because they're putting them into different planes and different orbits for different reasons. So um, the earlier ones were designed to capture the first bit of coverage, and so we saw a lot more of those. Um, they're now backing up coverage in other areas, and so we're not, we here aren't seeing as many as the primary reason. Okay? Um, in the lecture video, you mentioned a subset of fixed wing aircraft that can behave like rotary wings. Um, were you f uh, referring to canard rotor wings? No, things like tilt rotors. So they're fixed wing, they're rotor, tilt wings. Um, there's also the tail sitters which have been so popular, you know, we see a lot of those, the ones that take off and land vertically and then tilt over using a propulsion system. Those are the combination of fixed and rotary wing aircraft. Now, what's really interesting is when they're in rotary mode, they fly a lot like a modern multi-rotor in a lot of senses. When they're in fixed wing mode, they fly like an aircraft. In between, they are a dog's dinner. And if you get that transition corridor going from one to the other wrong, you pile it into the ground. V-22, during its test flights, had a lot of issues with that. Test pilots that aren't here today because of that. Um, what's the difference between the Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope? Okay, Hubble's big, James Webb is even bigger. 
But the biggest difference is we're putting James Webb out at a Lagrange point. So it's far away from Earth, outside of all the noise and light from Earth, and it's a lot cooler. As in, it gets a lot colder out there, so we can see near visible spectrum, near infrared a little bit better. It's a much more ambitious project. It's only a decade late, but I think we might finally launch it uh, in December. It is now in French Guiana to be integrated with the launch vehicle, which generally is a good sign. Okay. Uh, are we expected to know a wide variety of aircrafts to see if they fit into the question? No, I'm not asking you, like, do you know about the 787 or the 767? We'll talk about them in lecture. I'll ask those kind of things. But that's not important. What you do need to understand is those kind of things like, this is a fixed-wing aircraft. Can you point to a flap? Or what does a flap do? Or what does an aileron do? That kind of stuff. Okay? Um, is the bell...